<laughs> we're live and I'm doing my dance, <laughs> doing my happy dance. Uh, today we're going to talk about doing your own custom intake manifolds. And the reason for that is sometimes that sort of stuff comes up. It becomes necessary because there are a lot of applications where people don't have, like if you have a small block Chevy and you type in, hey, what are intakes available for small block Chevys? There's about a bajillion of them. <laughs> same thing with small block Fords, same thing with LS motors. But if and, and in the video or in the in the thumbnail that's up for this video, if you type in, for instance, 2008 uh, 1.8 liter Nissan Versa engine, there's none. <laughs> All there are is cold air intake manifolds. And the reason that this came about, and this is another example, although there are lots of other examples that we can talk about because I've made custom intakes for modular Fords and small block Chevys and LSs and all kinds of stuff. But this one was done out of necessity as well. I was writing a book on then B segment performance and what they meant by that were all of these little cars like Honda Fit and this Versa and the Yaris and, and the Scions and all and all of these smaller sport compact cars. And I was doing a, a writing a book on all of the performance stuff. The problem was the Nissan Versa that I had, there was basically no performance stuff. There was the usual stuff like cat back exhaust and cold air intakes like that AEM. I, I love the guys at AEM. They do cool stuff. Um, there were those kinds of things, but there weren't any real performance things. Like there weren't any camshafts for them or there weren't any ported heads that anybody was doing at the time. You could obviously do your own turbo kit. And I decided, hey, well, one thing that this thing needs is it needs its own manifold. So what I did was we obviously took off the factory manifold and found out, looked at it and it went ooh and on what, what made it tick. And then we made an adjustable one. And so I could adjust it and find out what this particular motor, it was basically stock except for a open exhaust, we um, could find out what the motor needed. And so I made an adjustable one and like, okay, it wants to be this length and this diameter. And this is this is kind of the best combination of, of you know, compromise for the power curve that we wanted. We got gains and they weren't all at the top of the RPM range and we didn't lose a whole bunch and stuff. And so uh, my buddy Tom, who was at West Tech at the time, um, after we got, after I got done doing all the testing on the adjustable one, then the really hard part, in my opinion, figuring out what the motor wants is just a matter of doing something that's adjustable and then asking it what it wants. And it will tell you, hey, yes, I like this runner. Like, yes, I like this length. I like this. I like this. And I don't like this. And it will tell you, it's really easy. All you have to do is ask the question. And then the hard part though, is then making it fit, which you could see on the photo for the Versa. Um, packaging becomes difficult because one of the things that I wanted on this particular one is since we were making it with production uh, capability in mind, I wanted to do a setup that would work with the factory air intake, the factory air box, and like this AEM intake. And we are the AEM, this long tube intake that's down in the fender well, so it gets cold air. It's actually a cold air setup. And as you can see, the air intake system is actually the mass air meter is in the in the air intake system the same thing with the factory deal so we wanted to make sure that it worked with all of those so designing that and making the the throttle body have to be in a particular position you can see that on the photo that there's a provision for the idle air motor although it's remote that it has all of the provisions for the different um water cooling and stuff that we're all, that we're all going through there and the pcv line and all that stuff so we made it so all of that stuff worked and it packaged and fit under the hood and fit with all of the other things, which that's really the difficult part. Because a lot of times you have to compromise the design of the intake manifold to facilitate its fitment inside the chassis. You know, there are a lot of times when we can make manifolds that make a lot of power. <laughs> that's all great, except they don't fit under the hood. So it's almost useless unless you have something that has lots of hood clearance or it's a, a sand rail or that kind of thing where it doesn't really matter what the thing is. It could be grand and, and, and impressive as long as we don't have any hood clearance limitations. So this thing worked very well. It picked up, if, if I remember right, 13 or 14 horsepower, which was quite a bit, um, you know, because the factory stuff, on a factory motor with all of that, um, it tends to work fairly well. The other thing that we didn't have the ability to do is I had no tuning ability. 
We had no way to, I mean, we could raise and lower the fuel pressure probably, but we had no um, ECU tuning at all. So we just put the manifold on and, and monitored the air fuel to make sure that it didn't lean things out too much. Um, but the intake manifold was just a bolt on deal and it, and it ended up working fairly well. And if I have any, if I have any, uh, Versa guys out there, I think I still have that manifold laying around somewhere in my storage because we never did production on them or anything. I, I don't know what kind of market there would be for a Versa, but that manifold is still available. So if anybody wants that manifold that's available, I would be happy to sell it to you. It's just been sitting for years and years and years. Um, and I drove around. I drove my Versa around, which I had way back when. I drove it around for for years and years with that manifold on there, and it, and it worked fantastic. Um, it sounded cool. It made good power, and it did all the things it was supposed to do. So not only was it a good exercise in um, adjusting the manifold and designing it so that so that it worked, but it also fit and drove around and did all the things it's supposed to. So it was a it was another step up from the usual things that I do on the engine dyno. Man, I lost my losing my camera again. <laughs> doing the blowfish come on come on zoom back in come on work with me work with me um so but but that made me think about you guys and then what happens when we have another application or, or maybe that there's something that's not offered that should be offered uh you know there's a ton of different manifolds available for ls stuff but maybe there's still room for more things to be better um, you know, maybe there's something like, if you take a look at the, look at that. Wow. 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 Um, if you take a look at the offerings for the LS stuff, there's lots of good stuff like the fast manifolds good. And then the, the cross ram deal that Holly does is, is fairly good and offers a good combination. I'm definitely, um, looking into a new camera. I don't know what the heck's going on here. There we go. Um, so I, there are lots of different combinations available, but that doesn't mean that there aren't better ones still available. And, and I've made some uh, adjustable manifolds for LS applications and for modular applications, for five liter forward applications for, and I've done stuff for rec port, cathedral port and LS seven and the dual plenum, um, you know, adjustable runner stuff seems to work fairly well on those. And, it, it, and it, it's possible to make, uh, a good bit more power than the other stuff that's there. Again, you know, I, I've never tried to package any of those to make sure that they would fit. And certainly under the hood of like a Camaro or, or a Corvette would, would definitely be problematic. But like for sand rail stuff where we have lots of room, there's certainly some power potential to be had there. And the same thing with the small block Chevy. I think that even though the small block Chevy has been out for a bazillion years, that there is room for somebody to make a fast LSXR style intake manifold for a small block Chevy. I think that's one of the things that's holding them back. I mean, we've all grown up on single plane and dual plane small block Chevy stuff. And now there obviously are fuel injected stuff thanks to the tune port revolution that happened. But, um, and, and the manifold like the stealth Ram works fairly well, but I think that there's even better ones to be had. And I, I don't think anybody's really applied themselves to make one to make the equivalent of a fast manifold for a small block Chevy or a big block Chevy. I think that there's there's room for manifold uh, development on those older on those older motors. And I think that there's still power to be had there, especially for like street guys and stuff for the for the RPM range that most of us run, which is 6,500 and below. And I know racers are going to say, yeah, oh, no, 8,000, 8,500, 9,000, whatever the number is. The vast majority of cars that are running around on the street are 6,500 and below. So if you made one for that, you'd be much better off, which is what the fast guys did and why they didn't need to make one that has four inch runners and have it be for 8,500 RPM. Cause the number of people that will buy 6,500 RPM uh, intake manifold are much greater than racers that are looking for the, um, the last little bit of power out of the, out of very high RPMs. So, and I also did, um, when I was doing that B segment book, um, I not only did I do the intake manifold for the Versa, but I did intake manifolds for the Scion, the 2.4 liter XB, the, I did one for the XA. I did one for the Toyota Yaris in which we had a, a, fogger nozzle like an individual port fogger nozzle i don't think we ever ran it with the fogger nozzles with four fogger nozzles on the toyota yaris because it you know let's <laughs> let's be honest it doesn't really need that i don't know that you could go small enough on the jets the jet the hole would basically be closed 
to get as little power as you wanted to get to that motor. Just a single fogger in front of the throttle body would have been a much better choice. But all of those manifolds, and I did stuff for the, I have some manifolds that I did for the Miatas, because uh, there are different engine families for the Miatas. And we did a bunch of those. And all of those, uh, we were fairly successful in, in making more power. You know, it just takes, um, I want to say trial and error, but it's not just trial and error because we're looking at specific data and going, oh, it lost here and it gained here. And, and then we start, you know, like I said, the motor tells us what it wants. It's all, all, all we have to do as our job is we just have to listen to all of that. Um, so we made a bunch of manifolds for that B segment book because there weren't any that existed. So if you guys are out there and you have applications like, a, you know, maybe a Barra, maybe there are a bunch of manifolds available for that, but maybe there are some that guys need to build. This 4200 Atlas, the Amerabear, is a perfect example of that. We're going to have to make a manifold for that because there's not 10 of them that are out there on on eBay that a guy can buy. You know, there's no uh, equivalent like sniper fabricated manifold equivalent on the for the 4200. Um, you know, I honestly think that it's possible that somebody could do a Grady style like Calvin did uh, a 3D printed one, which is cool. I just I'm worried about because I did a 3D printed one for the LS. And it's really cool looking. I've always been afraid to run it just because I'm worried about the temperature. I don't know how much temperature that the 3D printed stuff that we use would take. Maybe maybe the one Calvin did is better. Maybe you could do an aluminum part um, that would take some of the heat away. And we were thinking about trying to, you know, water cool it and do all sorts of weird things on the LS one. But um, there are definitely applications where you would want to do your own manifold. And obviously, we're going to do those on a couple. Like, you know, even the 292 Chevy, which... I think I could do some kind of manifold and make it better. I don't really like the Siamese ports on that one, but like I definitely want to do one for the 300 Ford. And uh, I kind of would like to experiment with one for the Slant 6 as well. Although I do have the cool Aussie Speed one, which I'm definitely going to try. I I'm going to try to run some more tests on the Slant 6 the next time I go down. I'm working out all the stuff for the 4200 now. I have springs on order and I have... Um, what else do we have coming? Um, camshaft. Talked to uh, the guys at Snyder uh, Camps today about regrinding them. So we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. But um, a, a custom intake manifold, is, and, and in, in this case on the 4200, definitely adjustable, is, is definitely on the list. So, all right, let's see how you guys are doing. Let's see what's going on. Wilson sheet metal manifold. <laughs> Everybody hit the thumbs up. Woody's right. Would it be stupid to try to run Mercedes V8 off a GM computer and sensors? No, as long as the as long as the Mercedes, as long as the trigger patterns, because the computer doesn't care that it's a Mercedes or a GM or Ford or whatever, as long as it has a a crank trigger pattern and a cam trigger pattern that the computer will understand and recognize then it just thinks it's a motor. If it's a V8, it's a V8 and it has a 58X or 24 or, you know, 36 minus one or whatever it is, as long as the computer will recognize that. And a lot of them, like the Holly has a drop down menu so that you can select all of that stuff. And if it will recognize the crank sensor and the cam sensor, and then you're in business and, and tune it, it will work. <laughs> Where's the pizza? I know I need to have pizza. What would be a good three bar map sensor? Um, Holly has a lots of map sensors. 89 Mustang here, running the Explorer ATM. Have you found that on average when you sell a bigger camshaft, it will require more timing to make more power than a small cam? I have not found that. I've found that the the usually they want the same timing. If you take a look at the test that I ran, the video that I have up on the six liter stuff where we ran a stock LQ4 or LQ9 camshaft and we ran an LS3 camshaft and we ran the sloppy stage two. And then we ran one of the comps, a 459 or a 469. They all made peak power, at, they all made best power at 29 degrees. Uh, Dakota's timeout. I have not heard of putting the 331, 354, 392 Hemi heads on a Pontiac. Guys do lots of cool stuff that we've never even heard of, but I, I haven't, I'm not familiar with that.
Let's see. <laughs> Dean Stevenson. There's your pizza, Tim. We need a good EFI manifold for the 4 4.9. I think that that actually would be fairly easy. Julius, all the aftermarket bearer manifolds are short runner deals. Better to stick with a stock dual runner BBM manifold. Um, and Julius, I have a, I think we're getting a BA, so an early one. Um, what intake is that thing going to have? And what rods is it going to have? What's the difference between a dual plane and a single plane? The biggest difference is a single plane is a big common plenum with all of the runners going into this big common plenum. Uh, single planes make high RPM power and dual planes make low RPM power, just generically speaking. Usually on a typical small block shaver, small block four, the crossover point between where the dual plane stops making as much power as the single plane or stops making more power than the single plane, it's about 5,500 RPM or so. Uh, Dean, the Barra or the Ford 4.9 has a 4.4 inch bore spacing. The Ford Barra has a 408. GM, the 4200 has a 405. So you can make one size fits all <laughs> with taper to suit. I don't know how you're going to make them fit on a 4.4 inch. So that's four and a half. And then a 405, that's pretty close to four inches. That's a big spread between them. I'm worried that the Aussie Speed has two short runners. I should have got you the long runner version, especially if we have no camshaft in it or a mild camshaft in the, um, but that just means that we need to put more cam and ported head on it, right, Julius? I have a fully built 4.9. If you want to test one, it has a 75 millimeter turbo on it. That's a lot of turbo. New Zealand's in the house. JP Weld Manifold. You can do that. You can form one up. You can actually make one out of fiberglass. Power outage at work noodles. Yeah, we had power outage here too. We were with it for, we were without it for a, a few hours. I had to, um, I, and I had all my information on my computer to do the video that I just posted. If you guys haven't taken a look, go take a look at the video I just posted on the valve spring test. So I, I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute too to find out what you guys thought about the change in power from changing the valve springs. Can you discuss design consideration between wet and dry flow manifolds? Uh, honestly, I don't think that there is. I know that people will tell you that um, that maybe surface uh, finish would, you know, help, I don't know, keep the fuel in suspension or that kind of thing. But you can run a dual plane wet manifold that was originally designed to have a carburetor. You can run it as a dry manifold, it works just fine. Um, the hard thing is uh, some of the dry manifolds like a factory LS truck intake manifold, for instance, that's not going to work as a wet manifold because where the air can go and the turns that it can make, um, it can do that. But it, it can't do that with water, carrying water in suspension because the water hits stuff and it comes out of suspension and then you have puddling and all kinds of things. Mega squirt is good for all sorts of engines. I like testing with the mega squirt on the 4200. It worked. It worked very well. Uncle Squirrels here. Is there a run length sweet spot for best top end and low end? <laughs> yeah, it's called an adjustable one. <laughs> Short runners for top end and long runners for bottom end, and you you, you can't make both of those work. Have you done much tuning with the Mega Square ECUs? Only on the 4200. That's my first time. But the thing is, the thing is with every ECU, no matter what it is, all you have to do is figure out like what buttons do I push? How do I get the thing turned on? How do I get to the point? How do I get to the area where I need to be to make it go? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put less fuel here. I'm gonna put more fuel here. I'm gonna put less timing here. I'm gonna put more timing here. Once you can do that, and you and you have an idea what those values should be with the fuel it's easy because we have a, a an air fuel meter and you go okay i want to run this thing it, it's a turbo motor we want to run it at 11 and a half to one if it's 10 and a half we take away fuel if it's 12 and a half then we add fuel that part of it's really simple the timing gets a little more critical and less so on an na motor but definitely on a boosted motor you, you need to kind of know and have a little bit of experience on how much timing you can try because a lot of times with boosted stuff you can keep adding timing and the motor will, will go, hey, look, oh, we're going to make power. We're going to make power. We're going to make power. Now I have a broken part. 
So it will keep responding until you let all the magic smoke out of it. <laughs> and that's never good. Bruce, you want maximum advance in early quite for performance, but as RPM get up there, you have, have you ever pulled timing out and got more power? Uh, Bruce, traditionally you increase ignition timing with RPM. And the reason that you do that is that <laughs> You want the expansion to happen at the same time. But since now the piston is going a lot faster, you have to initiate this spark so that it happens at the same piston position. Uh, but since it's getting there quicker, you have to start it earlier. And that's why you do have more ignition, ignition advance at higher RPM. When you look seriously at the Atlas inline five cylinder, you will do a similar comparison of the different years like the 4200s as it was produced longer. I'm curious what the change was when they went from 3500 to 3700. I, I don't know. We're gonna have to look and see if we can even run a five cylinder first. Tim, have you ever used a timing light to see what the difference is in indicated ignition timing according to the spark table and actual ignition timing? We do that when we set up the ECUs normally. Um, and on a on like an LS or something, we have to we have to TDC the motor so that we know where TDC is and then mark it. But um, and especially like when we're setting up a new ECU, when we did the mega squirt on the 4200, we did exactly that. We wanted to verify that when we have 25 degrees put into the somewhere in the timing table, I like will make the whole timing table 25 degrees. So wherever the bubble is, it's going to be at 25. And then we go out with the timing light and verify that that's 25. And then we'll move the whole thing. We'll make it all 30. And then we'll check it again with the timing light and go, yes, it went from 25 to 30 when we commanded it to go from 25 to 30. Because just because you say you want this thing to do something, you have to make sure that it did that. And after it does it once or twice, you you, you usually go, okay, it seems to be cooperating. It seems to do what we're telling it. Because if you have a turbo motor and you tell, I want it to be 20 degrees, and it says, oh, did you say 30? <laughs> Let's go to 30. Then bad things happen. Uh, Julius, BBA has a BBM manifold, if an NA, and this is an NA one. Hey, Richard, does uh, T. Meyer Inc. make good rotating assemblies? I want to buy their 440 kit for my 351M. Uh, I've heard good things about them. I've never used them, so I can't tell you specifically, but I have heard good things about a lot. Most of the 400 guys tend to get their stuff from them. Let's see, about to rebuild my 90 454 SS. Those are cool. I have a nice set of ported... Closed chamber heads. What piston should I go with? Uh, it, your piston is going to be determined by obviously the chamber that you have and then your desired compression, whatever. I like flat top pistons, but that usually on a 454 is going to give you fairly low compression. So they almost always have some sort of small dome in them. Um, I don't know what the chamber volume is on that head, but on your typical 118 to 120 cc head, we normally go with the uh, you know, an 18 or 20 cc dome on the piston. Have you found a trade-off between volume and velocity when it comes to intake length? Uh, the intake length is not, we're not so much worried about the volume of the runner as we are the length, because the length is the reflected wave and the reflected wave has to travel up and back the runner. And the time that it takes determines when the extra, you can think about it as supercharging, but it, it provides a pressure wave that helps fill the cylinder. And the time that it takes for it to travel that, which is why this is determined by length, um, determines when that pressure wave arrives. And so it's less about volume. So Dean is saying, make the six runners tapered at an angle and long for the 4.9 and cut off more for the 4.0 and more for the 4,200. The bore spacing will come down to suit. 
So how do you have an intake flange that's movable by a half inch? Because <laughs> where that's where the problem is where they bolt up is going to be the thing. Any thoughts on the Holly Sniper EFI or Phytech? I'm stuck between the two and can't pick an intake. It's for a blueprint. Uh, I've not run either one of those uh, on a small block Chevy, so I can't really say. Um, I'm a bigger fan of a carburetor on a carbureted manifold than I am of the four whole throttle bodies run on those. Australia's in the house. Hey, Richard, does Trickflow make a better 351 Ed head than, uh, 351 M head than Edelbrock? Again, I have not run a back-to-back -back test on the Trickflow Cleveland head, because that's what that is, versus the Edelbrock Cleveland head. Um, you should be able to look at the specs on the two and kind of figure that out. A lot of times they'll give you flow data on those. And so you can kind of compare those. Admiral's here. Do you think you can run a 3D printed resin manifold? I People have run 3D printed manifolds before. I just don't know what they're changing, what kind of material they're using to, to run those. The OEMs have done it for a long time. They they make a lot of their test manifolds. Um, they 3D print a lot of the stuff. Megasquirt will, all, will do all the tuning for you. That's another thing that I don't like to do. I don't like to run wide open throttle at under closed loop. Ideas on how much fuel pump you need to feed a 555 inch roots blown E85, 1100 horsepower mathematical formula. Uh, yes, um, it takes, it's gonna take uh, a little more than half a pound of fuel per hour to to make blown, well, it's probably gonna take more than that. So 0.65, uh, I, I would use 0.7 in my formula for that. Uh, depends on what it's printed out of, yes. So I use, if you use a 0.75 brake specific, you should be able to figure that out. Would a 1.75 phenolic spacer change RPM characteristics much on the Holly System X? Uh, it's not going to change it a lot. It may shift it a little bit, 100 or 200 RPM under, and under boost is not going to matter. The reflected wave still has to travel the same distance. Have an extrude home port one. We tested one of those in the in a couple of videos. Do they flow much more than as cast? It depends on how much they ported it, but yeah, normally they do. But if it's boosted, you're not really worried about the extra flow from that. You have some flow from the boost that you'll go find. We made 39 pulls on an LS in four hours with the mega squirt system. Is there a formula for how much timing you can run per pound of boost? There, there isn't for me. There, it'd be more likely that you'd have a number that's the amount of timing that you would pull out of an NA timing per pound of boost than how much you would supply. Have you ever tested the power between stock 088 heads and 049s? I have not run those two back to back. Um, my suspicion is the difference in power is gonna be based on the, um, the test motor. If you have it on a mildly cam 454, I, I doubt you'd see much. Um, I don't remember what the chamber size is on both of those, but you might see more of a difference there. I, I don't think it could take advantage of, you know, a mile 454 is not going to take advantage of what a rec port head has to offer anyways. And I, I, the 049s perform really well. Make a variable LS intake manifold, that would be cool. Uh, in your opinion, batch fire injection versus sequential injection. We don't see power when I go from batch to sequential. Uh, and I even went the next step further and we went um, tuned individual cylinders with the sequential. And again, I, we didn't see a big change in power. We saw a big change in air fuel because we made all of the runners even and made them safe because we had 802 sensors in it. But I was surprised at how little power it gained, even by changing the air fuel as much as a full air fuel point in one of the cylinders. Do you trust CNC Motorsports for engine builds? Uh, I don't think I have any experience with them. 
I suppose the runner length and shape of an LSXR manifold is pretty optimal. It is. It's really good for for that motor and for that RPM range. Uh, Jason, the knock sensor is not required. It's reading the um, crank and cam sensor are the majors. Some of them, we don't ever read them because we normally run a Holly, but you might also be reading the mass air meter, which would kind of be critical. Yeah, and you can't just put knock sensors on anyone. The knock sensors would be better off being um, teamed with their respective ECU. But again, if they're not going and you're not screwing them into the exact same spot on the exact same kind of motor, they're going to read differently more than likely. <laughs> I'm that guy. Customizing the 351 lower truck manifold. That's cool, though, for the dual throttle bodies. That's awesome. Uh, sometimes it, it is very, very expensive to make your own. That's the other thing that a lot of guys don't realize. Oh, these intake manifolds are too expensive. I'm going to make my own. And by the time they get halfway into it, they're like, oh, yeah, this is kind of fairly expensive, too. Yeah, Julius, I agree. I, I mean, there, if you just look at the rated power output of the Barra, of the BA version, the early one, the first one, I guess, the lowest power one, um, is not going to, I think, make the power that even the 05 4200 makes. It's not going to make the power that the 06 makes. And so, uh, but what I want to find out is I want to run one of these inexpensive um, BA NA Barras and find out how much power that thing can make. I'm going to add boost to that. I, and we'll do the normal things. We'll put head studs on it and, and gaskets and, and the oil pump and springs and then see. And because, you know, everybody uses the turbo motors that have the better rods. But what how, has anybody ever run one of these motors to find out how much power these these rods will take? They, they have to be as good as the powder metal rods that are in the LS, I would think. But I don't know. I've never even seen one in person. Looking to upgrade my Bronco's five liter EFI manifold to the Edelbrock one. Is it worth $300 or supporting the intake? The factory intake manifold is not as good. I, uh, and that being said, I tested a lot of different five liter Ford manifolds back in the day, but I never tested that I can remember. I never tested the truck one. So I can't say specifically how good or not good the truck one is. My suspicion is that it's not you know, guys would have been using it a lot if it was much better than the factory car one. And, and usually the truck stuff is more tuned for torque. So I would think that that would be the case on the truck EFI manifold for the five liter. After place the camshaft in my 1994-54 SS pickup, can you recommend a new one? It's completely stock truck. Uh, take a look at some of the small offerings that the guys at Comp Cams have. You can talk to them about some. Uh, I, I would pick something mild like a 252 or 258. They they probably they might even have some emissions legal cams for those. Is there a cam that can give you good mileage with a small LS and still be able to breathe? good work a turbo or is it a choice of one or the other it's not a choice of one or the other you can put a turbo on your stock motor and it, and it works just fine you can make 600 horsepower easily with a turbo and the stock cam any any other cam that you put on there is going to allow you to make more power at the same boost so you can put a small stage one truck cam on it the btr torque cam or other people make stuff that are similar and you'll pick up 30 or 40 horsepower and then you'll pick up even more than that under boost so you can make all of that work So Jeremy, you did a custom 98 Jeep four liter intake for your turbo combination, raised, tapered runner, larger plenum, relocated throttle body and some porting. Cool. Racer is saying that the Edelbrock Cleveland head is not good. 4,200 powers in the house. 
always make more power with a carburetor. <laughs> I love it when people do the absolute things. Carbon fiber, ceramic, heat resistant gasket to keep the heat away. Yeah, we were looking at we were looking into that stuff. We're looking into the gold foil, you know, because we want to spend big money. Edelbrock had a pro port forward head. They also make a Cannaval LS. Yeah, for really uh, racy applications. <laughs> Cleveland stuff you don't muck about with. Australians, that's awesome. Buy Aussie stuff. The CHI stuff is very hard to beat. I, I agree. I mean, if you take a look at what Kazi did with the CHI stuff, it's, it's, it is pretty impressive. And I run a few tests on, and I think I have some stuff up on the channel. We ran some stuff on the, um, I think we put CHI heads on the, on the Boss 302. Richard, is there a formula for how much time you should take out per pound of boost? It, yes, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because <laughs> it varies based on how much, uh, based on the octane of the fuel that you're using and also other things that are going on with the motor. The temperature, where you are, like the charge temperature, the temperature of the motor, what the chamber shape is like, what the piston design is, what your back, what your back pressure is. There's a lot of other things. You should run a safe amount of a safe amount of time, <laughs> which means not very much when you're running pump gas. Uh, Bruce, I don't know what V8 you're talking about, but typically if you look at an old small block Chevy or small block Ford, um, a big block Chevy will want, may want even more than 36 degrees. We've seen old iron headed big block Chevys that run best around 40 degrees of total, total timing out at the horsepower peak. The timing will be highest at the, the, at the power peak. In a lot of these carbureted applications, the distributors lock. So when we loaded at 3000 RPM or 3500 RPM or wherever we loaded at, the, the, the distributor would be a, a performance distributor would be would have all of the advance in any way. It would have light springs. The, the weights would would make the sit in cervical advance so that everything goes in by 3000 RPM. Factory stuff might be 4000, but that's what a hot, you know, a hot upgrade to your distributor would be back in the day with the small blocks or, or with the a, a, a carbureted distributed small block or a big block. But 36 degrees is about where a lot of the small block Chevys and small block Fords and on the, on the Chevy side, not the not the vor later Vortex stuff. But all of the stuff before that, it wouldn't be unusual for them to have that much timing. Um, but, you know, we, we don't even care so much about when we're testing stuff about what the number is. All we do is start low and then, okay, let's add a degree. Degree, let's add a degree. Let's add a degree. We keep adding and the motor says, okay, I'm, I'm not making any more power. And then we stop, you know, we go back, back to the last one where it added power and that becomes the number, whatever that is, but it wouldn't be unusual for 36 to be a number for a carbureted small buck Ford or small buck Chevy. Dean, I, I know that you keep telling me about this intake manifold, but I'm still not understanding how we change the <laughs> the flan that bolt the flange that bolts to the head. The only way to make it work on runners that are or on ports that have different spacing is to make the flange adjustable. I, I don't know how else you do that. Hey, Richard, do I have to match heads with intake from a specific maker? Uh, no, you don't. You can put any cylinder head with any intake manifold as long as the openings are the same size. Calvin built a couple of manifolds for 4200. Yeah, I, I talked to Calvin, his dad, yesterday. Two and a half millimeter between cylinders, three and four for oil passages. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I've had the, I can't remember taking it yet. Uh, Mark built his own. What, uh, how much runner length did you have in yours, Mark?
<laughs> James. I figured the 8.1 liter rods would be at least as good as the LS ones too, but I'm told they're not even close. I haven't seen anybody try to run one of those like on the dyno after putting ring gap in it with boost to see where the limit is. Uh, yeah, Jason, then normally the, when we run a, a holly or whatever, it, nor, it can also have water temp and coolant temp. Um, it also plugs into the coils. Uh, but we don't, a lot of times we don't run air temp um, and we don't have to run coolant temp. We just zero it out. So that's not having any effect on the tune. Um, but they're good to have because it's good data. It's good information. We almost always have that on the dyno because the dyno has a sensor on it, but we can also have it with the Holly. Uh, Dean, what we could do is, is instead of making um, a flange that is long in one piece, we could just slice the, we could just slice the flange and then we could put multiple um, bolt holes to bolt it up to the different heads. And then we could just move the flange wherever we want. And the rest of it is just runner. That's just simple. It's just runner and plenum. And we usually connect those together with um, either silicone couplers or sometimes rubber. Sometimes we just slide them together. What I'll do is take tube and swedge it and then they'll just slip it inside of each other and then i just use like gorilla tape and hold it on there for the test it works really good oh yeah i forgot about tps somebody else needs to remind me of all the tps and iac but again you don't even have to use those we've run lots of those without tps or or iac Um, Julius, does that BA engine that we're getting, does it have decent rods in it or are they not the cool fancy turbo rods? About the stock of the turbo 600 horsepower motor, would you recap the rings? I would. Because it's going to take you with a stock cam, it's going to take you 10 pounds of boost or something to get to 10 pounds of boost or more to get to 600 horsepower. <laughs> Where's the mics, Rich? I, I, I agree. I, 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 today was today was a little bit of a tough day for me. We had a lot of things happen that um, that, re that might require some mics. Who was the guy that did the CHI intake design in the 185 and 205 heads? Julius might know. I, I've met him and spoke to him back in the day a lot and because he helped us out with getting us stuff. I, I can't remember his name, though. Thoughts about a bypass port possibly linked between the runners for the reflected wave to exit early. Where's the port going to be though? And and why would you want the why would you want the reflected wave to exit early? Let's see, Luke Thompson, I played around with the BA and a silver top, stock GT3582 turbo and 21 pounds, E85, lasted 18 months. Daily driver, 10.7, 131, over 50 quarter mile passes, eventually been a rod at 25 pounds. See, that's a lot of power. It's a lot of boost, a lot of boosty. So now, Luke, everyone's going to ask you what your timing curve was. John's, uh, John, Uncle Squirrel's out. Let's see, Devin, what do you think about a 38 millimeter Makuni or clean carbs as I swap in by just cutting the MPI manifold plenum off? I have an 87 CRX. I plan on doing this to any big issue you can think of. I've run uh, an IR manifold on Hondas before and they, it works very well. Um, you should be able to get fuel to it without any problem. Uh, it's not going to be ideal because what you're doing is you've got the, um, like with a, if, is it a side draft or, or is this going to be a down draft? It's a side draft. Um, you're going to have runner and then plenum and then runner again. So it's going to be a weird signal. So the signal is not going to be as good. If it's a, just a conventional kind of down draft, you'll, you should have no problem. You just do a, you're going to make a flange and then bolt the carburetor on. 
<laughs> the SEMA Bluetooth intake runners. Yep. Any plans to write another book? No, probably not. Neville and Scott March did the design work on the CHI 3Bs. Thank you, Dean. Mark saying his runners for the 4200 are about 12 inches long. See, that's that's a lot longer than most of the Grady style manifolds that guys use on these six cylinders, like the two J's and stuff. Does boost improve idle on a higher duration camshaft? No, because there would be no boost present at idle. Wow, that Julius, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> no, Richard, you have the weakest possible bear you could you could have, but it's still a bear. <laughs> That's awesome. If you're going to run boost, you got to run at least one bar. Anything less is just a tease. Well, that's how you double the power output of the motor, right? So we're thinking that, like, the, for instance, the Barra, let's say, it, it, I'm thinking it's going to make less than 300 horsepower NA. I'm thinking it's going to be closer to 250 maybe. Um, and then so we got, you know, with one bar, you got to get to 500, right? Is something with a curved runner like an LS Gen 3 Hemi intake less efficient than a straight shot? You would think that it would be, although it, when I've made these manifolds and we've made them as straight, because a lot of times I'll do, you've seen some of the, the photos and videos of the runners just basically being straight down into the head. When we eventually make them rounded, um, it doesn't seem to change the power output. Um, I don't ever remember doing a direct back-to-back -back test on a curve versus a straight one. Um, the flow didn't seem to change dramatically when I tested it on the flow bench, but the, the reflected wave is not going to change. It still travels. That's still a length thing for it, but you'd think that it might affect the flow. But I think in all the manifolds that I did, we probably had more than enough flow in the runner to feed the head. Like we had, for instance, on the, uh, on the, uh, the photo that I have up for the thumbnail for this video, we have the Versa intake manifold. I think that that, um, you know, the motor's only making 125 or 130 horsepower. And I think, I think each one of the runners probably flows, you know, 250 or 300 CFM. So it's got way more flow than it needs. So even if we take a little bit of away with a bend, I, I don't think it really affects it. <laughs> wow, shots fired at David Visor. Is David Visor as good as he says he is? I think anybody is, right? Or or Gail Banks for that matter. Um, no, I like David. He's he's done a lot of stuff. He's he's done a lot. Obviously the powder Tim <laughs> Tim's going off on powder powder metal rods. Obviously, the Gen 4 powder metal rods are really good. They make a we've made a like a million horsepower with them. Factory gaskets are not great. M MLS fixes that problem. The tuning matters. Flash tunes are okay on a standard ECM, but if you're starting to lean on it, the bigger turbo go Haltech. Um, Julius, what is the, I think somebody's told me this before. What is the bell housing for the, um, I think, I think the guys out here have bell housing. I need to talk to the guys at Holly um, because they have that trans company. I think that they have one because they got me a, a bell housing for the, the six cylinder RB25 that mates to a GM transmission. So I think that they probably have one for a Barra as well. Um, does ARP make head studs for the Barra? I was talking to an ARP guy today, so I told him I would ask.
Dave Storleen. Okay, I remember that name. Factory BA engines rated at 250. That's kind of what I thought. It, it might make a little more the way that we test it. So you can run a longer run and still have top end. Think of a way to improve the breathing efficiency of the longer runner by minimizing the effect of the reflected wave. The reflected wave is what gets you all of the torque. Um, what you want to do is have a sliding runner so that you're changing the length of the runner with RPM. That's the best way to do it. Or the other way that guys do it, Porsche does it in the way that the GSR guys did it with Honda, is they have another set of valves that open up and then it, it allows the motor to breathe through that short section, basically that short part of the runner. And that works too. Uh-oh, unstable. We're unstable. Come back to me. Come on. Come on, you silly, silly internet. Come on, internet. Come on back to me. chat's still working yes a telescopic intake runner is it works good or a, or a dual stage runner also works good on speed density or mass flow tps is more for enrichment yeah a lot of times what we'll do on the tps stuff is we'll just hook up another tps that we might have and then we'll do a tps auto set and then just disconnect it and don't use it after that Uh, Julius, yes, ARP has studs. Bell housing is its own deal, but there are heaps of aftermarket options to suit a Turbo 400 power vibe. That's what we want. We just want something that's like Chevy-ish. Variable runner intake length is good. That's uh, And I have lots of videos and lots of down tests where we've done a bunch of different runner lengths where we have it varied. I've done it on Hemis, I've done it on Modulars, done it on LSs. Yeah, the Hemi has a, a dual runner intake, and we ran a test on that. I have that video up. I do have an RB. I have it. I don't. No, I don't have an RB twenty. I have an RB twenty five. How's my connection? Are you guys still seeing me? <laughs> Can you still see me? Yay, am I back? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, can you see me? Yes, yes, I can. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't disregard what David says. He has some really out there thinking and it's, and, but it's awesome. I want to, I want to hear all about it. I want to hear any more now that I'm not 20 years old. Um, I don't know everything <laughs> like I did when I was 20. Man, it's getting hot in here. Yeah, my connection is super laggy. Kind of getting out. Connection funky. The chat is running fine. Montana, I like to hear that. Big Sky, right? That's right, right? Montana, that's Big Sky. That's Wyoming. Is the that's not the show me state, is it? Let's see. Same, same. Gonna do any testing now? Possibly you can see it's super choppy. You lost connection. Is the 4200 the Godzilla motor yet? RY44 is a ridiculous motor. We got six minutes, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's using a video camera to use in 1980 at 7-11 for security. <laughs> but it only films in black and white. Have I ever been to Pennsylvania? No, I have not. I take that back. I have been. I've been to Pittsburgh. Boost and runner length, same. The reflected wave works exactly the same under boost. It still has to travel up and back the runner length. So an intake manifold that makes more power down low and A also makes more power down low under boost. Oh, a JDM two liter six cylinder. That's like the RV20. 
JDM six cylinder Toyota engine with a Yamaha twin cam. I like it already. Came out in the early eighties, pulled around 7,500, one GGE. Nice. I need to track one down. Cool. Uh, Mark, I think the intake is ready. He sent me pictures of it. I think it's ready to test. I cut an Edelbrock small book Chevy tunnel ram in for my 4.3 liter. That's cool. Let me know when you run that. I'm, I'm curious to see that. I had an RB25, my R33. Very, I'm very jealous. Very awesome. Cowboy State. I haven't seen anybody recently on the chat from Wyoming. We did. I thought we did. Oh, no, we didn't have Wyoming. We had Montana, right? Bruce likes RPM. Woody's is out. What do you think about planning, fabbing a plenum on a Ford 5-liter lower intake for a short run application? You can. They did that back in the day. Car Tech and Downs and, and Hartman, all, all they all did boxes for the either the factory 5-liter lower manifold or the GT40, or I think they even did them for the, the truck or the Celine manifolds maybe too, like the Trick Flow one. Um, and, and they work okay. It's a lot shorter run like, and you're going to lose a lot of power down low. All right, Jewish, I will, I will hit you up, man. Thanks. The 3T GTE. Nice. <laughs> Just remember to boost the 5.9 Magnum to the moon. I don't think it's going to take moon boost in, in the Magnum. Yeah, I sent a message to Jeremy. I know that I know that he's a busy guy. I want to talk to him about the um, the forty two hundred heads, but I'm gonna I'm probably gonna find uh, another person to do a ported head for me. Who, in your opinion, is the best engine engineering company? You mean like McLaren or somebody? <laughs> the Magnum will take it. Boost, boost, boost. Yeah. I heard it just blows that like bottom panel off of the off of the beer keg. Two minutes. Two minutes. T minus two. Get your questions in. 351 Big Bang coming. I would like to. That would be that would be fun. Ever messed with the Bosch CIS K Jet tuning? I haven't done any tuning with them. I had a Porsche 924 for a while that I think had that on it. Uh, we wanted to turbocharge it. Do any of the drive by wear LS engines utilize IAC? I don't think they do. I think that that's part of the throttle positioning. I put a carb on a 3.1 liter GM and a Chevy Lumina. Nice. That's because you wanted to be like cold trickle. What's the best place to find old parts? I got a 1990 Toyota Celica. Got to look online, man. Are the 4200s heads ready? Uh, no, Calvin's not going to send those. The but the I think that the ones have if we're you're talking about the ported ones, we're not going to do that or for his ported one. Um, the other ones I think are ready. I think the valve job and stuff is done on them. Yeah, Cosworth is good stuff. Why did all the American cars from the 90s have such long run lengths? Because they were trying to enhance torque production. Ordering a cam, ISKI cam for my 496, 632, 244, 248, 10 and a half to 1. That should work good. 14 PSI and 32 degrees on pump gas. How's a boost, but never 9,000 RPM. We use factory bolts all the time, so I, I don't think you'd have any problem reusing ARP stuff. But one of the things you have to remember is that when you change over to ARP rod bolts, um, you might have to resize the big end of the rod. <laughs> A big bang bike engine, uh, that would be cool. A 924 Porsche, isn't that a recycled Mazda? 
I really like the Porsche. It handled very well. It just had no power at all. It really needed a turbo. The 944s were a lot better, um, but the 924 is all that I could afford. We even painted it bright yellow because, you know, the yellow Civic I loved and the yellow Porsche. Get those likes in. We're just timed out, yo. Surely you can't be serious and don't call me Shirley. Cheap metal intakes. Yep, we've done those. Yeah, the 924 handled very well, like I said, but you'd step on the gas and just absolutely nothing would happen. <laughs> it's up and, you know, make 157 views right now, 119 likes. Man, get those likes up. Come on, guys. What's going on? I will see you tomorrow. Dude.